Welcome to Chris Parkin Shooting Sports. Now, some of you will have seen, about a month ago, I did a video and I basically did a walk back using this CZ Stainless Synthetic in 2.2 rimfire. It's just an everyday hunting rifle. Nothing too complicated, nothing too fancy optic wise. It's an element helix scope on top. And basically I walked back just to see, you know, what it was like shooting at the longer distances. Well, I got back to just over 100 metres and I'm now out on another day. Weather's improved a little bit, ground's a little bit dry and I've got some gongs out at further distance today. Now, I'll put a link in the description and on screen so you can see the first part of that video and see what I did. But essentially, since that time, I've done nothing. I've also not got any more ammunition in the same type, so I might have to swap ammo a bit later on, but we'll explain that when we get to it. The only real changes I've made are I have actually set up a ballistic app using JBM Ballistics, which is a free app and um, works pretty well. And you can, you know, program that with the data you've got and refine it as you go along. And I've also put the trigger cam on top. So hopefully I can start doing some video of the targets being shot. So let's have a go at 150 meters, which I've put the gong out today. And according to my app, which I've set up, I've got a drop figure of 4.7 mils so i'm at my zero which is a 50 meter zero and if i go up to 4.7 mils let's see if we can get on the target now i have also put out a small wind flag so i can see what's going on but this is pretty much the first shot i've had at this distance so let's see if i can make a hit it's fairly light winds today it's not too bad so we'll see how we go on how we get going Now, I hope that's recording now. And here we go. We've got a hit. It's a little bit low, but we have got a hit. So, now if I remember correctly, this is a second focal plane scope and on full power, it should read in mil. So I'm gonna come up about half a mil. It's a little bit too high. Come down one click. Good for height. It's just moving across a little bit to the right. Now I'm just going to check that my windage was actually zeroed but there is quite a lot of wind through the range for just a 2-2 rimfire. And actually, yes, I wasn't actually zeroed because if anything, it should have gone right to left, not left to right. We certainly appear to have got quite a nice little group there, 150 metres. But I'm going to just dial on a bit of wind now. And shoot another five. I'm just going to take one more click off the elevation. So at 150 metres, I'm now running at 5.1 mils. And after I've done these five, providing everything goes well i'm going to walk down there and i'm going to put the target a bit further away so we're at 150 now should we go straight to 200 or do we want to stage at 175 first you can of course make the stages as, as small or as large as you want the smaller you make them the more uh, chance you are of getting accurate hits but on the other hand it depends on your backstop and how easy it is to see your bullet splash and also how much ammunition you've got spare because i've got less than 100 rounds left to go today So, 
that's doing quite well. The plates swing a little bit, so you do get a little bit of vertical. And it's not the most stable of benches, because I'm just in sort of semi-field conditions, but it's a lot better than shooting off the standing sticks. Uh, I'm quite happy with that. I'm probably just going to take another click off and leave that 150 mils, sorry, 150 meters, and just put that on a straight um, five mil elevation rise. So let's go move the target now. Right, just walk down to the target. We have paint, we have a hammer, and we have a wind flag. But here is the gong. So you'll have seen these actually on video through the scope. And we got the first shots coming in over here, last few shots coming down into the center. So we just made a few refinements. But I'm using a gong that's big enough not to go, oh, I hit a really tiny gong at loads of distance. I'm getting using a gong big enough. It's about 250 millimeters, this gong but um, I'm using it big enough so I make sure I can see my bullets strike because there's no point wasting a load of ammunition and missing out on where you're actually hitting, is there? Just as a little mental note now, I've actually put this gong down now just over 200 metres. And the point is, I've actually found it easier and a bit more accurate to stand behind the gong and to use my laser rangefinder when I have one all the way back to the vehicle that's parked next to my shooting bench. Now, the reason I do this is because, although they've got a nice little crosshair and a lot of range finders, they're not as quite as super accurate as you think in terms of getting the exact ping to what you're actually wanting to turn the distance from. So it does make sense to range find the largest object if you're using a range finder. Never, ever, ever think that having an actual long tape measure is a bad move because you can lay that out, pin it to the ground where your shooting bench is and you can walk all the way back with that and keep putting your target out where you want to. And if you have to measure to a certain point, say 50 metres and then measure onwards, it's probably more accurate than using a laser rangefinder on many occasions. So don't feel that you're being left behind by using a tape measure because Certified rangers are usually set up with very accurate measuring equipment to make sure they are correct. Building sites, things like that, huge, great commercial sites, they're all set up using theodolites, lasers, this, that, and the other, but things that are certified to a much greater level of accuracy in terms of the distance they measure and the precision with which they can actually, actually pick the exact thing they're measuring to and from. So yeah, don't feel bad if you're using a measuring tape. Okay. On the first video, I did say, I'm not gonna to use toys and this, that, and the other, but time and weather is against me. So I kind of needed to, to make things a little bit easier. But again, go back to the fact, you can use Google Earth if you want, just to measure out landmarks on your property. And it uh, gives you a bit of an idea where you're starting from and to. But of course, the more distances you shoot, the more refined you'll get your data anyway. Now, this scope has got a zero stop, which is fantastic. But if you happen to have a scope that doesn't have a zero stop, what I will say is take careful written notes on a notepad, piece of paper, whichever you prefer, because it will help you remember everything that's going on and you will waste less time and ammunition. Now, of course, you can do the walk back, but we did cheat. We did use a free ballistics app. Now, I think everybody pretty much these days, if you've got a rifle, you've more than likely got a smartphone you can run these things on here. And I've put that steel out, I measured back, and it's at 206 meters. So on here, my close is 205 meters, and it's telling me eight milliradians. Now, I might just take a couple of clicks off that, because it was a little bit high before. So we were at five milliradians for 150 meters. So we go six, seven, eight milliradians. We're gonna leave it on now, and let's take some shots there. Now I can feel the breeze has picked up a little bit again on the side of my face, it's a right to left breeze. I can see the wind flag with the naked eye just blowing just right to left, but not, not excessively so, and it's reasonably stable, reasonably steady. It's actually worse where I'm sitting because I'm near the gate and the opening in the hedges, whereas down the field, although you're into wide open space, it's actually in a little bit of a bowl and there's hedges all around it. So it does slow the wind a little bit. Just switch this camera on. Hopefully that's recording. Now I'll probably just be a little bit more cautious, a little bit more time to make sure I'm totally stable with these. 
in a competition situation or if you're doing a bench rest match or something precision precision like that or better still shooting prone you're going to have a more stable rest than a portable shooting bench the thing is if i shoot prone with a mic on my chest all you'll hear is me scratching and moving around on the floor and you won't be able to hear me speaking clearly which is why i prefer to use a bench when i'm making a video Right, so I've had several shots, just aiming at the corners, picking up the splash a little bit in the grass. And I'm now aiming central and hitting approximately central. So let's see if I can put a five round group down. I'm currently on 8.1 milli radians and I've got half a mil of wind on there. because the wind has actually reversed completely and it's now blowing left to right. So you can see now we've got strikes going central. Perhaps one thing to note is the fact that when I'm actually making the shots, um, I'm keeping my head on the gun. I'm staying in position as much as I can. Obviously opening and closing the bolt disturbs the rifle a little bit, but I'm controlling the rifle with the rear bag, which is not you know, an enormously complicated accessory. But the point is I'm keeping my head down and watching and seeing if I can pick up the bullet strike or the bullet strike off target where it's splashing. And of course, the noise is the biggest notification that you've seen or heard something. So that's great. But what you must not really do is kind of do this bang and up like that because it's useless. That's the best spotting scope you're ever going to have. So there's no point nodding like a Texas oil well. Anyway, we appear to be hitting centrally now. So my mistake was made because I wasn't watching the wind and I can see the wind flag now it's blowing back up towards me I think now it's just moving across to the left a little bit let's have five more shots I'm not really one to fuss on about technique and try and teach people, but I will tell you what works for me. A very wise man who is actually an advertiser on this video said to me once, imagine trying to watch your bullet in flight. And that's essentially what you're doing. Keep everything in position, make sure you're not twitching and moving around. And imagine you're trying to watch that bullet in flight. Now, the less recoil you have on a rifle, the more likely that is to happen. And of course, in PRS and things like that, everybody now is using muzzle brakes and very heavy rifles, very accurate balance points on them to try and keep the rifle as stable as possible so they can see the bullet in flight and hopefully impact as well. And of course, at very long ranges, when you see the bullet in flight, you see the trace and the bullet, it gives you an immediate indicator where you might just lead your eye slightly, a little bit left, a little bit right, etc., in flight. I'm 
I'm kind of being a bit deliberate now because you'll also notice my finger doesn't spring straight off the trigger. I tend to squeeze my trigger and when it breaks, it's an actually tiny, 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 infinitesimally small surprise to me. I am expecting it to go off, but the actual instant it breaks from a position like this is a teeny bit of a surprise. And the whole point is you hear all this thing about follow through and this, that and the other. Well, follow through to me would indicate you're actually trying to do something deliberate. I'm actually trying to do nothing deliberately. I'm hoping that that shot ever so slightly surprises me because I'm not gonna set up with a flinch or anything like that. And then of course, on a 2 2 in fire, you've no recoil, so you don't need to worry about physical pain from recoil. But if you have a flinch with a bigger rifle because of the recoil, recoil and you start twitching your trigger and snapping at it, and I will give you an exact example now of what you really don't want to be doing. Now I've, load, I've closed the bolt on an empty chamber, but what you don't want to be doing in total is this. That's the last thing you want to do because you're just disturbing the rifle, you're not seeing anything, and that visual element there is something you're missing out on totally. So just go back, a few more shots now. But essentially, I'm actually enjoying shooting today. It's probably not the smallest group in the world, but I'm gonna go down, I'm gonna respray it, and I'm gonna shoot another five rounds off uh, just to see what it's like. So, put some rounds on steel, there we go. I did hear a couple of pings, one of them's there. You got a bit of a zing off the edge, and it looks like there might be one down there as well. But essentially, those are sort of some aim offs and, and tests. I was aiming up here at times, getting some hits. And Anyway, we've kind of found out where we're going now, the hard way. And now I'm gonna respray it and I'm gonna go back and I'm gonna try and shoot a five round string and uh, get exactly what's going on. Because the last few shots have come in nicely central and that's really what we want now to uh, make a good record of the refined data once we've developed it. See the wind down here, a little bit snappy than it is up there, and just the feeling of it on my face, I can definitely feel the strength is a little bit more now down here. It's picking up as the day sort of picks up as well. It's probably about 9.30 now, Let's check my watch. Time now is 9.46, so I started setting up about eight o'clock this morning, and uh, yeah, the wind was a lot lighter then, but usually that's what happens. The wind picks up as the day goes on, so the early bird catches the uh, lack of breeze, hopefully. The ground here is actually starting to firm up a little bit. It has been raining and raining and raining and raining and raining. I think everybody's pretty much had that everywhere since July or June last year. But uh, this field will be used for, uh, for hay. And um, I think as soon as the sun comes out, we are going to have this go mental. So we'll, we'll lose this shooting field for a few months, I think. I certainly won't be able to see that deer over there. Now, I'm often doing this with new rifles week in, week out, different cartridges, scopes, calibers, guns, etc. Hopefully, well, <laughs> I actually I actually enjoy shooting when, it, when, when life's a bit simpler. I'm not trying to run three cameras simultaneously and set up targets and this, that, and the other. And, and hopefully you, if you're doing this with your rifle, can enjoy a similar more relaxed, pleasurable experience. And I can definitely notice when I kind of go into setting up mode versus when I'm into shooting mode. So now I'm reasonably well set up on this and I'm gonna have a few shots with it, five shots and see how small a group I can shoot in these conditions. And I am really not Mr. Group Shooter Man. And I will definitely do better shooting a group if I put the bolt back in this rifle, won't I? Right, let's just switch the camera on as well. So the wind's picked up.
So you can directly see how those shots, fired in two slightly different wind conditions, gave me two completely different impact points on target. And other than watching the wind flag, which remained roughly in the same direction, you can't really pick up on it that easily. There's not a lot of uh, ground movement down there because it's very short, damp grass. But just as I sat up there and just to talk to this, uh, I can feel the wind suddenly pick up on my right ear. These are all the things that, you know, I'm no master of it, but you, um, you, you certainly get to learn it and shooting 2-2 rimfire is great because you, you, you notice more about what's going on because the bullet's less ballistically capable. Five more. There we go. So I'm not really shooting deliberately slowly. I'm not shooting deliberately quickly. I'm just trying to get the five shots away within the similar wind condition. Um, generally, I'm, I'm not going to talk, start talking about bench rest shooting or anything like that, but bench rest shooters, when they actually get going, they will try and shoot the five rounds off as quick as possible to try and keep it in that same wind condition because of course point of impact on target doesn't matter to them. If you compare that with an F-class shooter, it matters critically to them. So they have to watch for the wind changes and watch for the wind conditions. They take notes of everything because they want to try and repeat the shot in a previous wind condition they've used maybe five or six minutes previously. Anyway, let's go down and put the target further away. So, the first two went over here, and then we moved back towards the center when the wind came back in the previous direction. We had a couple go very high, one quite high, but there's a sort of groupish there, which is probably about three inches. Um, again, I'm not the best shooter in the world, but we're making progress, and the point is, we're enjoying it, and we're getting more data, more experience of the wind. And I have to say, that is key to knowing what's going on, because, Although I can see some of my impact points in the grass, as you can see, that's totally stationary now. But after the shots happen, if I'm missing on this, that and the other, I can immediately see where I've missed out on catching that wind flag and making sure I was correspondingly uh, adapting to a wind correction. So those are about 15 quid, I think. I used to give them away on little prize draws. They're an MTM wind flag. I love them and uh, they just fold up and go in a rucksack. And, um, I would definitely recommend getting one because it's certainly a great aid. And look at it now, it's just started moving. Now, we wouldn't see that wind, we wouldn't feel that wind 200 meters away, but you can see it immediately on that. And of course you can see that through your scope if you position it reasonably near your target. But of course, that wind is different all the way between you and the target to 200 meters of bullet flight, which is taking probably half a second because it's quite a long delay. You're sort of watching, waiting for the bullet to land. Anyway, I'm gonna move the target further back now. Right, I took about another 50, 60 strides further along. I also forgot the range finder. So we're gonna to have to try and measure it from the shooting bench and make the best we can. But when I come down to retrieve the target, when I've finished, I'll ping it accurately so I know exactly what it was and then I can add that to my dope chart for what I achieved today. The ammunition I'm using today is SK Standard Plus. It's not crazily expensive, but I think it's quite consistent. I quite enjoy shooting it. If you really are getting into seriously wanting to shoot rimfires long range, it's well worth experimenting with different types of match ammunition and also different velocities. Now this is subsonic ammunition, so it's still running less than sort of 1100 feet per second. But interesting fact for you now, the speed of sound changes with air temperature. So what works in the summer and sounds supersonic or subsonic and what works in the winter is a different thing because the speed of sound actually slows down in the winter. So you might start getting crackers if you're running ammunition that's running near the, uh, the supersonic boundary. So just be aware of that, that if suddenly the ammunition starts cracking in flight, it's not because there's a problem with the ammunition. It's merely the fact the air temperature has changed and you didn't realize just how close you were to supersonic before.
But if you chronograph it, you'll find it's actually probably not doing a huge amount different. Unless, of course, you leave your box of ammunition sitting in the sunshine and getting hot. Right, well, due to the target sinking into the ground, because it's still so waterlogged, we're going to have to pause today at 250 metres. But please tune in for part three of this, where we'll go to 300 metres and beyond. I'm going to move to another location for that, which is a little bit better drained. Um, I hope you've enjoyed watching some of that. Um, it's been pretty much real time. I'm not going to tell you that it's easier for me than it is for anybody else because I just quite enjoy doing it sometimes and I think if I'm natural on camera that reflects the fact that I'm actually enjoying shooting. This rifle is great fun to shoot. It's, it's, it's a total hunting rifle but you can cross over and do as you like with it for shooting long distances. And yes, it's maybe not quite as accurate as the LRP with a matched chamber and the longer heavy barrel and the bigger heavier stock but in a way I sometimes enjoy shooting it more because it's easier to sort of move around with, go hunting with, and this, that, and the other. So anyway, please like, subscribe, comment, don't forget to click the notification bell so you can keep track of my channel's regular uploads. But for now, thank you for watching and keep your eyes peeled because part three will be coming soon. And don't forget, in the links, there'll be part one and also various of the reviews on this rifle in detail and the other CZ457s. Thanks for watching, bye for now.